Hi, Jeff Flimlin again with Hal Folson. Uh, we're going to continue the conversation in a slightly different way. Um, one of the things that the audience, I think, who are going to be watching this program are going to be interested in is how do we get these main lines set up for the seaweed? And a lot of guys who have been involved in fisheries, especially lobstermen, will pick this up very easily. But Talaf, show us, you know, what it was that you started with and then how that evolved over time. And then I'm going to ask you a couple little questions about specifics as you go along and then we'll kind of finish it up. Yeah, fantastic. What I did when I first started, I was working under a NOAA SBIR grant and a contract with Bioarchitectural Labs tied in with Stat Oil. I was in a no-fail situation and nobody had really put in a seaweed farm in the U.S. before. So I started, to be safe, with these huge concrete blocks and line going straight to the surface on both ends. These weighed 2,000 pounds each, which is a real limiting factor for a lot of people with small boats or people that want to enter the industry. And the other problem with these was you have to maintain them with divers on an annual basis unless you have very large equipment to pull them up. So when, as we moved along and I started putting in more farms, I designed what I call my portable farm. I went to a system that is so simple, you can literally put it in in the fall if you're doing the sugar kelp, take it out in the spring, or if you're doing an annual crop, you can still do the, um, you can basically take it in and out at will. And it really just consists of a plow anchor, a third, uh, to the surface, we go with three to one scope on the surface. So I put a third chain, and then I do a line to the surface the rest of the way, which is another two. So this scope here is three to one. And then at the top, we have a buoy, and the buoy has a piece of PVC and a counterweight, and this keeps the line at seven feet below the surface of the ocean. This allows almost any boat in this area to pass right over the line, even though by definition and with the state of Maine, we have to um, be out of navigational, heavily navigated areas. We can't compete with local fishing and all that. So what we've done with the buoy, so what, what we've done with the buoy system is we just use a seven by fourteen lobster buoy, and the hole inside that is perfect to insert a three quarter inch piece of PVC. This allows us to keep the depth that we do seven feet, which is a real good growing depth for kelp. The other beauty of it is I'm just using three eighths or half inch pot warp for my lines. So the only things that the lobsterman, if you're a lobster person or fish or per, fish person, would need would be the anchor and the chain. All right, so Talif. You say that the, the things can come from Hamilton Marine. What size plow anchor are we thinking about? Are, are there different ones for different bodies of water? And what weight and size chain are we thinking about that's going with, would you say, three-eighths or half-inch poly yes. line, right? Yeah. yeah. So what we do is, I start, if you're doing an LPA, which is only 400 feet long, I go with the 66-pound plow anchor. Uh, plow anchors work fine in mud and sand, and where the fixed two fixed points and not swinging, it gives you plenty of holding ability. And then we just go with three eighths chain. You can get away with quarter, but depending on your site, the more chain you have, the higher performance of your plow anchor. Now, the beauty of this system is, as you go up into like right now, I will be moving to a four acre experimental lease site soon. I'll jump these up probably to 120 pound or so because I'll be running a thousand foot lines as opposed to 400 foot lines. And the same goes with the chain, too. As you go up in size for the anchors, you'll add a little bit heavier chain to them. Did you say that the chain uh, and the line going up to the top buoy is a third of it is chain and two-thirds is line? Yes, I go with a three-to-one scope. One-third chain, two-thirds line. And that gives you plenty of holding power. We've actually done some experimentation at the University of New England and with Dave Fredrickson uh, from the Navy at Annapolis, and we've actually figured out the braking strengths that we need for the lines, for the moorings, and we're building that up now to work with longer lines, possibly offshore. The beauty of this is, once you've got the mooring system in, and then you've got your first buoy in, we run 200 foot. I've decided on 200 foot because of the way that we do our seeding, we found that we can use 20 gallon aquaria that are stock items to put our PVC uh, string, uh, seed string lines in. And this allows us a real easy element here. We'll do the, the buoy, the pole, and then we'll go to our, and the weight. And then we go to our line. We run this line 
200 feet sections. It makes it real easy to control, and we found that that also is adequate for the depth control to keep it under control and keep it at the right depth. And then you seed this, you seed the 200 feet in, and then you clip in another buoy, and you just start with your next seed spool for the next 200. The beauty of this is you can run any length that you want. Now, here's one of the questions I've been thinking about going through this. You get, you get the main line set out first, completely, right? Then you're gonna come with the spool and you're gonna wind the wire, the rope around it. Jeff, that would be a good assumption, but we've actually made it simpler than that. The way that I've designed this, this is going, this goes down to the mooring, uh, to the anchor. The way we've designed the system, or I designed the system, is you start here and you actually put one spool in as you deploy the main line. And so you start with a nice clean line and it gives you a nice free run. It really works well. Okay, so all you're starting with at the beginning then is the, the two buoys and anchors at either end, and you know that, or you don't even nope. put the second one in. You know, you put so the first. The whole thing as you run. Exactly. The site that you went to yesterday at the University of New England, this is how we installed it. We drop the, we drop the anchor. We ran back up the line, and we installed this first buoy, and then we tie in with our, with our seed line, and we back right down with the boat. I like to back down, you can run forward also, but I usually back down, you have more control. You're working with the tide and wind, you set up ahead of time for that, and you just back down the line. And when you get 200 feet out, you put in another, <laughs> helps if you use the right colored caps. You put in another buoy system with the weight underneath, and you just tie it back on. You, you cut the line here, you tie back on, or you can continuously tie it on either way and you just continue with your next 200 foot section. So what's the total length that you're gonna, for, for somebody starting? Well, if you're just doing an LPA, all you really need on the surface is your end buoy, your middle buoy, and your end buoy. And then what we also do is we actually on the anchor, put a tag line on it, which is really great. You've got the plow anchor, and we actually have a tag line. So on a 400 foot section, you'll have four buoys on the top and what this lets you do, it's crown line is the technical name, I call it a tag line. You can hook on this with your boat and pull it backwards and set the line to tension it to keep the tension completely under control. This is the most portable, easily set and easy to control system that you're going to find, I believe. So you've described how the thing gets set out. How long does it take to, to, to run this? Once all the gears in the boat, how long should it take to set out a 400 foot line? That line you saw at the University of New England is actually only 200 foot just because it was the first one in. But a 400 foot line like this, once I've got all the gear and the seat in the boat, I can install it in about 15 minutes. Okay. And so you would do, if you were trying to grow this commercially, you would do another line next to it. Absolutely. What do you think the spacing should be to that next line? With this type of mooring system, I like to see 15 or 20 feet. You can get away with as little as 10 because of the tensioning systems, but the closer you put the lines together, the more chance you have an entanglement later on. And when I was working under the BAL contract, we actually tried putting them five feet apart in that old system with the 2,000 pounders, and we saw decreased growth. Even though because you had two lines, you had more weight, you had decreased growth and quality. Well, I would imagine too that if, if you're running a skiff or something in between, you get too close, you're gonna have a potential of screwing up with the line next to you. Well, that's actually, it's amazing. But with this system, with the PVC, and the way the system is rigged, because of the PVC, you don't tend to get this in the prop like you would a regular line. That's another advantage of running the PVC. The main reason was we tried it without the PVC, and as it helped grow with the currents, it would roll right up the buoy till it was on the surface. So we put the PVC in to con and the weight underneath the, the counterweight to keep it at a continuous depth. Do you orient the lines in a specific direction with the, or thinking about what's the wind in this area, where's the tide run, how do you decide how, which what direction you're going to set them out? For the wind, I like to have multiple sites. That way, if the wind's coming out of the southwest, you go to the site where it's protected in the, from the northwest. And I've done this continuously with my aquaculture operations. You can set the current swirl so much on the inside that you want a decent current but it really doesn't matter the direction quite so much. I usually run with the contours of the bottom and with the coastline to minimize impact on other fisheries and navigation. All right, now, uh, I've, I've heard two schools of thought. Some people leave the main lines in all winter, uh, all summer after they've harvested in the spring, and some want to uh, take them out. What's the thought on why or why not to do this? Well, the beauty of this system is it's so easy to pick it up and take home. There's absolutely no reason to. You leave the system in, you're going to get more wear on your fixtures. You're going to get more wear on your line. I've successfully uh, fished the same piece of line four or five years with the system that I use. Because there's no real wear and tear on the gear that's it's in there. It's floating in the water, and the only 
thing that happens is you run it up over the roller on the boat when you're harvesting. Your biggest, most move, the biggest movable parts are where this crown line attaches and where your surface line and chain attach. And so this is probably the most critical juncture. And the beauty of this compared to the box is you bring it up every year, you can see it, as opposed to having to send a diver down or get a huge barge out there and bring up this large piece of equipment.